A, B, C, D. Get these guys. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I think we'll do five today. Oh, hey, hey guys, I didn't actually see you there. Yeah, creepy, creepy creepers. <laughs> Welcome back. I am, as always, Captain Foley. And I am Commander Cockings. I said welcome back, guys. Um, but Captain, you're sounding a bit more crazy than normal, which is saying something. What's up with that counting and rhyming off the alphabet? Do I have to worry about you doing other really weird, crazy things in this episode? Well, maybe. <laughs> no, actually, I'm just looking for an interesting way to introduce today's ship. Uh, the ship we're doing today uh, is a ship from Enterprise and from a very familiar and popular race. So it's not Federation. And if you'll remember, I stopped at D and was interrupted by our viewers at five. So today we're gonna to be examining the Klingon D5. Cool, and as an added bonus, we'll have the one and only John Eves, the designer of the ship, to talk in a bit later, and all the designing in and outs for this ship. So that's gonna be cool. We can do that? Uh... I mean, we, we can do that. We can do that. That's actually very cool. <laughs> uh, let's get started, because today is a good day to D5. That's that's funny, but but don't sing my battleship. I need the, I need the battleship to... Uh, oh, yes. Uh, right, okay. So the D5 was introduced by the Klingon High Council in the 2120s, or 2140s, depending on what source material you look at, which is always the way with Trek material, um, and served for over a century and a half. That's over 150 years. And everybody thought that the Enterprise was old when it was retired at 40. I mean, seriously. That does say something about the different cultures, doesn't it? It's like, oh, we'll just keep putting anti-rust spray and just throw it out again. And <laughs> Actually, these were the main bulk of the Klingon fleet for a number of years. And as it turns out, the D5s were some of the very first larger battleships fitted with a newly acquired Romulan cloaking technology at around 2269. Which I guess makes sense to equip a tried and tested ship with this brand new tech, but that's kind of interesting to see and to think such an old ship would be the test bed. But So this treaty and information exchange with the Romulans of both technology and design concepts took place about one year prior in 2268. Hmm. Uh, that whole Romulan Klingon treaty thing sounds like it should be its own separate episode in the future sometime, Samuel. What do you think? Well, we've talked about it for, <laughs> well, literally since episode one, so I think we should, yeah. I think yeah, there's, should. A lot, there's a lot to discuss on that topic for sure. Uh, the ship's space frame was also utilized to test other newer technologies later in the ship's service, like dilithium power focusing, among others. Uh, these newly introduced technologies would then be reintegrated even better into later designs, such as the D6 and D7. That makes sense. I mean, we would uh, test on uh, really strong but capable ships nowadays, so if you've got a winner... Yeah, absolutely. So this design was actually very, very important in the design history of the Klingon Empire, and helped usher in the newer and better tech and design elements, as we were talked about. In the DS9 episode, Once More Onto the Breach, however, the D5 was, this is a bit of a weird one, it was considered an old design by 2370s. That's 200 years after its introduction, which is a bit odd. I don't, hmm. Might have been a slip in the uh, slip in the dialogue there, but, yeah. or very versatile ships, um, especially after the 40-year thing you just said about the Enterprise. Klingons really knew how to build ships that last, um, and while it's very unlikely such ships would be at the front line of any battle, or in any battle of any kind, um, equip the space frame with state-of-the-art weapons and shields, and keep a good hundred of them you know, at Kronos or any other major outpost, I think you've got a pretty nice defense fleet there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this design shared some of its design traits with the Raptor-class cruiser, mm. and the early Bird of Prey, which was in service at the same time. There was there is some conflicting information about the size of the ship, however, but through some good old fashioned Trek Yards research, we think we have found the definitive numbers for you guys. So this ship measures in at a length of two hundred meters to the NX01's two hundred and twenty five meters, and consisted of a crew of forty eight, only forty eight Klingon warriors. Um the ships often served patrol duties throughout the Klingon Empire and very rarely ventured into enemy territories unless part of a large contingent of ships. The Vulcans had detailed documented files on the D5, but these were, of course, classified and not fully shared with Starfleet in the early years. Thanks for that, you pointy-eared hobgoblins. They did make things difficult for us, didn't they? They did, indeed. 
The D5, just like many of its successors in the Imperial Klingon fleet, was a very rugged warship that a hull comprised of the fusion bonded monocrystal, monocrystal, and was one of the new Klingon design styles distinguished by its roughly avian or bird-like form. The bird of prey from the same era shared its design cue, which would of course be seen in the later and most widely screen used Klingon ship, the bird of prey, first seen in Star Trek III, the search for Spock. This was obviously a slight improvement on the Klingon's older, unique design aesthetic of a small forward hull attached by a long horizontal boom, which in the case of the D5 was widened, resulting in a stronger, more steady design, ending in a larger engineering hull with aft mounted impulse drive units above the two warp engines at the end of the back swept pylons. The vessel had two heavy disruptor cannons located at the bottom of the main hull. These were mounted on a type of turret platform which allowed the weapon to be rotated and fire at enemy targets regardless of direction. A great design idea for sure. It also had ventral mounted cannons on either side and even had one forward facing weapons port capable of firing both photon torpedoes as well as disruptor bolts nestled right in the very front of the vessel. The ship was protected by both defensive shielding as well as dispersive armor. In fact, the D5 was considered more advanced than Starfleet's most powerful ship of the era, the NX class. In the Season 2 episode, Judgment, when a D5 scanned the NX-01, they reported, we can defeat them easily. And while the NX class ship does get major refits and upgrades in terms of shields and weapons, it still doesn't appear to be a match for the D5 by Season 4. Z5 could even reach speeds of warp 6 when compared to the NX class's maximum speed of warp 5.2-ish. <laughs> uh, so she had shields, disruptors, photon torpedoes, and tractor beams, and was far more advanced than the NX-01. Well, you'd expect her to be, wouldn't you? The, the pride of the Klingon fleet. Yeah. Much like its Raptor class counterpart of the same era, the D5 battlecruiser was outfitted with a standard multispectral sensor palette, similar to those used aboard the NX class ships. However, due to refinements in the Klingon design, these were actually far superior to those on Starfleet vessels of the same era, especially up to a distance of about, of about 80,000 kilometers. After that range, sensor systems on both races were generally the same. Resolution-wise, however, the Klingons have a slightly longer range. The Klingon sensor refinements were generally on par with the Vulcan's own sensor technologies and could be considered equally as effective, except on the most advanced Vulcan ships. With a centrally located captain's chair, most D5 bridge configurations were the same, with the main entrance to the bridge being located behind the captain, with two consoles, one on either side of the door, and then a few other consoles scattered around the sides of the bridge. However, as is the way with Klingon ship designs, the ships were often customized by their captains, especially in the later years of service. Some later ships came equipped with an additional console located between the main view screen and the captain's chair as standard equipment. This resulted in the captain's chair being moved back a little. Uh, one of the main benefits of the D5 bridge was the ability to basically run the ship with only three personnel. Uh, a real tactical advantage in some situations, for sure. Wow, very much so. The D5 space frame could be adapted to use as a freighter as well, when it was stripped of its major weaponry. Then, eight underslung deuterium tanks capable of carrying up to 80,000 litres were added. This version of the ship is described as being little more than a freighter, and capable of operating with a crew of 12, and a skeleton crew of 4. Wow. Although, as you just said, three can run the bridge, so I guess that makes sense. This version was considerably less advanced than its battle cruiser counterpart, possibly the converted original run of the oldest D5s. It has a notable lack of ventral disruptor cannons, common to the class, and according to Archer, was no match for the NX-01 Enterprise. The D5 was, of course, designed by John Eves, whom we will speak to in a little bit later on. Uh, the CG model was done by Eden FX. The design was scaled in re relation to other models created at EdenFX at 155 meters. Uh, according to the Akutagram appearing in the episode Judgment, however, the length of the D5 was said to be a mere 75 meters long. And that's the tanker version, but still, same space yeah, frame. Hmm. Yeah. However, in my research I found length information from 155 meters to 210 meters in length also. The newest chart from the independent fan movie Axanar which utilizes the entire Enterprise-era Klingon fleet, uh, puts the D5 snugly between these sizes at a nice 179 meters. So they kind of averaged it out for us. Mm -hmm. uh, this was no doubt an attempt by Tobias Richter to average out the size, and I personally think this works for me. So it's one of those things you guys choose which what you like best, I think. But in my research, however, talking with Rob Bonshoon, the visual effects supervisor of Enterprise at the time, and from looking at the original 3D models, I believe the ship is closer to the 200 meters in length, and that's why we said it at the start. This is because they made each CG model at the time to scale with each other, and therefore 
when I bring the D5 model into a scene with the NXO1, which we know is 225 meters, and compare the two, we can see the D5 is 200 meters. And Rob confirms, because we've, we've talked to him, Rob confirms that this size does look right. And I think that size makes sense, given the size of the crew and the relative size of other ships at the time. But as always, take these size issues for what they are, and judge them on what you think is correct, given the facts that we have put to you. So you guys can create your own canon. In the animated series episode, The Time Trap, the Klingon ship that encountered the Enterprise is clearly a D7 with very slight design changes, but that was due to the show's creators only having one style of Klingon ship created at that point in Trek history. However, in writing the 1998 DS9 Season 7 episode, Once More Onto the Breach, Ronald Moore stated that he intentionally included a nod to the animated series by means of a reference to the animated series season one episode a time trap in this reference the elderly corps recalled i commanded the first divisions from koloff one of the older d5 cruisers to the battle of caleb four mm. so another oddity in trek history there well in starfleet battles the d5 is a newer but smaller ship roughly based on the heavier d6 and d7 classes mm. it looked like a smaller version of the d7 mm. so the animated series is correct if you are a starfleet battles fan and there goes Enterprise coming along and messing up established history again, but don't or, get me started on that. adding to it by giving us a real D5. This ship was primarily used as a light cruiser and was designed for rapid production and high combat performance in the smaller classes of ships. So here, all the facts we're about to tell you are related to the Starfleet Battles Universe version of the D5, so do not confuse them with the facts we've already listed for the canonical D5. The Klingon Empire was capable of building at least 18 ships of this class per year, and considered an exceptional design compared to other races like cruisers of the same time period. It was noted for its maneuverability and superior weapon arcs. Like most Klingon ship classes, many D5s were modified into a wide variety of variants during the General War, even including the D5VE, which was a carrier variant of sorts mm. with a modified shuttle bay designed to accommodate 12 small fighter craft. Mm. Despite the various versions of this ship, each one had drone racks, two phaser ones, mm as well as multiple Phaser 3s, with stronger variants also including Disruptors, and in some case a few Phaser 2s. But Starfleet Battleships are going to need their own episode, or episodes perhaps, so let's get back onto John's new design. I just thought I would show everyone that there's more to the Trek universe than what we see on screen. A lot more interesting stuff in most cases as well, in my opinion. And let's move on to behind the scenes, guys. Um, and as usual, very fortunate to have the man who designed the D5 herself, himself, John Eves. So welcome, John Eves, back to the show. Hello. So, John, take us back to when you heard you'd be first designing the D5. Do you remember the brief you got for this precursor to the very famous D7? Yes. Well, what we uh, what we did is uh, we got kind of a story arc, and uh, we knew we were going to do um, uh, Zindi ships, we are going to do Klingon ships, and uh, a variety of different Klingon ships came to list. And the uh, and the, uh, the D5 you're talking about there, we had to come up with uh, a new kind of Klingon ship and uh, using kind of the Raptor as the basis of the, the architectural design on it. Um, that's kind of where that, that came from. So you got some Raptor shapes, you got a little bit of Bird of Prey shapes, you got a little bit of the, uh, the original series Klingon ship in there. So it was a whole variety of ideas that we had to piece together for this thing. And... Um, uh, when we first started Enterprise, I had to do uh, a Klingon ship for the opening episode. And what we did is we tried to take the original Jeffrey ship and take it back in time. And that idea didn't fly. That's why we had to change the whole architecture of the Klingon ships. But in that process, um, to make Klingon architecture kind of go back in time, uh, I used kind of Soviet architecture reference, like spaceships and stuff. And everything seemed to have very heavy cabling that would hold things together. So I put this cabling all over the, that uh, Jeffrey ship, and that's what carried through to all the Klingon ships throughout Enterprise, was have this cabling that kind of held the structure together. And uh, not that they were like an unsound ship, but that just gave it a bit of strategy to uh, the structure and stuff. And so that kind of, that idea was just a merge of a whole bunch of different Klingon ideas, but trying to make a new architecture that would go with Enterprise. Kind of retro yet, something recognizable. Was there any keywords, though, in the original brief for this battle cruiser that they said? Was it make it aggressive, make it vicious? Uh, you say the piping was your idea, so that's, that's good to hear, but was there any actual... Uh, not remember? really. We would basically get like a, like, a, like a beat sheet first and would draw around that. The beat sheet is just maybe like eight, nine pages that gives you the arc of the, the script. And it will be as little as a new Klingon ship is basically what you get. A new Klingon ship enters the frame from left to right and 
and causes havoc or is in pursuit or something. And that's usually what you get. And so uh, um, Herman will break it down. Herman Zimmerman and I will go through what we need to do as far as ships go. And Peter Lawrence will call over and he'll go, okay, we need this and that. So it kind of correlates what we're going to use as far as ships go. And he'll decide if we're going to do something new or let the CG guys rebash something. And we're at that stage where we're still drawing new things. And um, so basically there was really not a lot of description except new Klingon ship. And so we'll do mm, three or four different passes, take them to meetings, and they'll pick or choose, say yes or no. And that one actually didn't have much in the way of changes. So it went through pretty, pretty easily. And the Klingons were actually an easier ship to get approval on. Zindi was very hard. Federation was very hard. But, but uh, uh, it seemed the Klingon went pretty good. And uh, as far as Mr. Berman goes, he loved the bird of prey. So as long as you had some of those elements, you were in, 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 in the, right, uh, the right lane. So uh, always making mm -hmm. sure that stayed in there. So how did you approach designing a Klingon battle cruiser that was 115 years older than the style we've come to basically see the entire run of Star Trek? I noticed the front end of this ship is a real departure. Uh, from pretty much any other Klingon design. I know it's got some elements of the Bird of Prey in there, but it's more of an angled look. And uh, you mentioned the support rigging and stuff, but can you tell us a little bit other design influences you might have had that you put in there? Um, trying to come up with a different kind of uh, bridge head design on that is always kind of a the, the key part of the Klingon ship because, you know, they uh, usually have that external bridge column that, that stands out on either the, uh, the Nilo Bird of Prey or the original series, you've got that bridge module up there. And when we start scaling the ships down, it almost gets overpowering. And so I tried to do that one as more of a battle-looking ship, so that bridge is actually encased in the uh, in the structure as opposed to, as opposed to being kind of a, a separate element. And so that was that was trying to make it a little bit more, not stealthy, but a little bit more kind of ergonomic in the design where the top is smooth and you don't have a, a, a major target. So if you're under attack, you don't know, hey, where's the bridge? Is it the front? Is it the back? Do we have to blow this whole thing off? Is it in the body? And so it's just more of a disguise than uh, 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 where it would normally be. And so it was it's just a, a roundabout kind of idea of come up with new shapes that, uh, that fit in the Klingon world, but kind of take it back in time a little bit. And that's always the challenge because you're drawing Star Trek in the future, and then they ask you to draw Star Trek in the past, which is still in the future. So it's kind of a, an interesting <laughs> back and forth concept. Yeah. And especially against TOS designs where a lot of the time they're just wood blocks with very little hull detail. So how do you pull back from a very you know smooth D7 to you know this ultra detailed piece? Well, guys, hope you enjoyed part one. Yeah, Stay me tuned. too. I, I, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it, you know? Good, so did I. But there's a part two on the way. <gasps> but you guessed that probably with the title. Um, but yeah, next week, guys, tune in for part two, the conclusion of this wonderful episode. See you then.